that joyous occasion, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Premier, in 1998, uh, as Minister of Energy, I undertook the uh, restructuring of hydro in Ontario. Thank God. And uh, we created an organized order. I've said before, I want the question put and the answer given in quiet. Please. At that time, we created an organization called the Ontario Electricity Financing Corporation. The purpose of the OEFC was simple. It was responsible for paying off all electricity debt in the province. As of March 31, 2013, that's the last year the numbers are available, that electricity debt was $27 billion. That's about $5,400 per ratepayer. The law requires that all money coming from a sale of any share in Hydro One, including Brampton, must be used to pay down that electricity debt. Premier, if money from your sale of Hydro One goes to infrastructure, as you claim, where will you find the $27 billion to pay off Hydro's debt? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know the Minister of Energy is going to want to comment on the details of that question, Mr. Speaker. But uh, I want to just uh, I want to just first say that um, I want to make it clear to the member opposite and to uh, to the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, that the reason we are looking at the assets in this province, Mr. Speaker, the reason we asked Ed Clark and his group to uh, to review the assets in the in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, was. I'm asking for the same thing in an answer as I did for the question. Carry on, please. So that we would have the ability to leverage those assets to invest in the assets that are needed for the 21st century, Mr. Speaker. We need badly to build highways, to build roads and bridges and public transit, Mr. Speaker, because there is a quite frankly, there's a deficit answer. of infrastructure across the country, Mr. Speaker. But in Ontario, we are doing the right thing. We are investing Thank in that you. infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, we saw this coming. In 1998, we feared that one day a Liberal government would come along and look to sell off assets with no regard to paying down the debt. Minister of Tourism and Culture and Sport. The Sport. government passed the Electricity Act, we legislated that every dollar from the sale of Hydro One had to go to the OEFC to pay down the province's electricity debt. That law, Premier, still stands. And it prevents you from putting that money towards anything but the $27 billion debt. Mm -hmm. Premier, are you going to obey the law or will you simply ignore it? She hasn't so far. Mm -hmm. Speaker, again, I know that I know that the minister is going to want to speak to the specifics, but I just think it is it is very important that people understand that this is a member of a party who sold the 407, Mr. What Speaker, who took absolutely no care in making sure that there would be an ongoing revenue stream, Mr. Speaker, that there would be ownership on the part of the, the province, or that, or that the, the uh, money realized from that sale would be used for specific— I am going to uh, ask the member from uh, Simcoe North to come to order, and I'm also going to indicate to the government side when she's answering there should be none, and I'm going to insist on it. Finish, please. There was absolutely no thought, Mr. Speaker, to the investment of the, uh, the money that was realized from that sale into the future benefit or future assets for the people of the province, Mr. That's Speaker. Right. All of those Sir? things are things that we are taking into account. We are not going to follow the path that the Thank previous you. government laid out, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't think the Premier gets it. Premier, if you use the proceeds of the sale from any part of Hydro One for infrastructure, for example, that $27 billion electricity debt will be, remain there for ratepayers or taxpayers to pay for many decades to come. So, Premier, is the cost of new infrastructure in Ontario going to become another expensive line item on our hydro bills? Yeah. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite brings forward and highlights some issues. That is of concern to us because that's the legacy they left when they tried working with this asset. We want to make certain that we do not do a repeat of the damages that they created for generations to come. I suspect he didn't hear me, so the member from Renfrew will come to order and the member from Stormont, Dundas and South Glengarry will come to order. Carry on, please. 
Mr. Speaker, we are not going to speculate on matters that are still being discussed. We have asked the Advisory Council reporting to the Premier as to the valuations and maximizing the returns to the people of Ontario. It's critical as part of those principles that we uh, provide incremental value to the people of Ontario. We protect the public interest and that it be open, transparent, and independently validated. That's exactly Answer. what we're doing. Anything that we do, anything that's created, will be there to ensure we protect the people of Ontario and the ratepayers. Thank, Thank you. you. New question, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister. Let me help by laying out how Ontario, the Ele Ontario Electricity Financial Corporation works under the law. Currently, the OFC has about $11.2 billion in stranded debt on top of the $17 billion it is guaranteed from a Hydro One sale. The OFC currently pays down that $11.2 billion debt through the profits made at Hydro One and OPG. But, Minister, if you sell any portion of Hydro One, that revenue stream that is used to pay down the debt will shrink. So how will the OFC pay down the electricity debt if you take away its primary source of income? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. The members will come to order. Carry on. It's a, it's, it's a great question coming from a member who's the critic who actually was part of the government that created the residual debt and now this retirement charge that the people of Ontario and the ratepayers have to repay. And as a result, we have taken the precautions and the necessary steps to bring it down. The member opposite should also know, and he knows fully well, that it's a function of the revenues coming through that stream. And when those change, it changes the amount of the residual debt. We're taking every precaution and every care necessary to get it reduced. We're helping the people of Ontario because of the damages that they created in the past. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Oh, my God. Very well, Speaker, I've never actually sat in government, but I am looking forward to the day. <laughs> Again to the Minister of Energy. It'll be soon. Minister, we know how you're going to pay down the debt out OEFC if you sell Hydro One. You're going to introduce new charges on the bills of electricity ratepayers. Yeah. It's the only way you people know how to do business. Hydro prices are already unaffordable. And just last week you admitted that they're going to go up by about $140 per year per customer. I can only imagine what the increase will be when you realize you have to pay down the OFC debt with less revenue coming from less ownership in Hydro One. Yep. Minister, what new charges will the electricity ratepayers of Ontario see on their bills in order to pay down the debt that you are ignoring? Yes. Yes, well, Mr. Speaker, a uh, couple of things. The OEB is going to be a regulator. It is now, and it will continue to be as we proceed forward in any, of, in any initiatives in regards to pricing. And of course, the, the minister, and I'll let him take a, the next supplementary, has done an excellent job of finding ways to mitigate and protect the people of Ontario and ratepayers as we proceed forward. The member opposite also is part of a, of a, of a party who, whose potential leader is talking about looking at this very issue. Exactly. They're, they're working on the premise that they want to be able to, to look at the valuations and the assets that we have before us to see how we can improve upon them. The member opposite and his team are the ones that have also initiated some of these ideas as they follow our lead, Mr. Speaker. We will lead. We will continue to do what's right to protect the interests of the public. Thank you. Okay. Final supplementary. After 12 years of this mess, they've even confused themselves, Speaker. So let's recap again to the Minister of Energy. The OEFC needs revenue to pay down the $11.2 billion of debt that it currently holds. But by selling off Hydro One, you're going to have to share that revenue with a new buyer. That means less money for the OEFC to pay down that debt. The only way your Liberal government will make up that lost revenue is by hosing electricity ratepayers yet again. Minister, when are you going to tell the ratepayers that electricity bills are going to continue to skyrocket when you try to pay down the $11 billion debt that you're responsible for? Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member is beginning with a false premise. He's beginning with a supposition or a speculation as to what we might be bringing forward, Mr. Speaker. But let's talk about the general principle. I have a quote here, Mr. Speaker, that I'd like to read. This quote says, 
The member from Stormont, Dundas and South Glengarry will come to order. Carry on. The quote I have, Mr. Speaker, says, As Premier, I will order an immediate review of all assets owned by government. Assets that don't serve the core functions of government will be divested, and every dollar made will be invested in new infrastructure right across our province. Oh, Let's that? use the full value of these assets to build the roads, highways, subways, and infrastructure that every Ontario can use. That is from Christine Elliott, member from Whitby, Oshawa, Mr. Speaker, in her campaign. That's part of her campaign. She should Sir, walk over here and join us. Start the clock. No, uh, your own caucus members were heckling. Member of the third party. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Energy Minister went on live TV to say that, quote, the government has decided that we will be selling a portion of Hydro One, end quote. But in spite of an accidental moment of truth from the Energy Minister, there are fundamental issues that the Liberals have not addressed. We've seen the Premier can't control private power companies, as an example, Eastern Power. You remember Eastern Power, right? They were involved in the uh, Mississauga gas plant scandal. This company has apparently been building pipelines without permission and forcing workers into unsafe work conditions. It seems the gas plant candle scandal continues, Speaker. But we also know that private power costs us more money. So can the Premier promise Ontarians that hydro bills won't go up after the government privatizes Hydro One and local utilities? Well, Mr. Speaker, as, uh, as I have said, as the Minister of Finance has said, as the Minister of Energy has said, one of the, one of the principles uh, uh, we're using using in the, the conversation that, uh, that uh, we're having with Mr. Clark and the conversation that he's having about uh, the assets, Mr. Speaker, is that controlling of price is extremely important to us. It's extremely important to the people of Ontario. The regulatory regime is extremely important, Mr. Speaker, so the protections of the people of Ontario are at the core of what we know we need to do, Mr. Speaker. But at the same time, I say to the leader of the third party, she ran on a platform that was exactly the same as ours in, in terms of looking at assets and building, and building the, uh, the realization, the leveraging of those assets, the, the money that could be uh, realized from that into Answer. the plan to build transit and transit infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is we are moving forward. We're implementing the plan that Thank we you. ran on, that she ran on, Mr. Speaker, so we can invest in. Thank you. Supplementary. Really clear is New Democrats are the only party in this House that fundamentally disagrees with the selling off of our public assets, including our hydro assets. The Premier will not make a promise. The Premier, Premier will not make the promise that selling off Hydro One and local hydro companies <laughs> won't cost Ontarians more because she knows full well that power bills are going up. It's going to hurt family, Speaker. It's going to hurt manufacturing. It's going to hurt our resource sector. It's going to hurt innovators. This morning we heard from uh, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture that it's going to hurt agriculture. It's going to hurt everybody except for a very small handful of private energy interests. So, will the Premier finally pull the plug on this ridiculous plan? Speaker, what is what is very clear is that the leader of the third party is one of two. She's a member of one of two parties in this legislature who don't believe that investing in infrastructure for the future is necessary to economic growth in this province. There is no Party, particularly not from the NDP, on how to invest in infrastructure, how to build the transit, the roads, the bridges that are needed across this province. That, Mr. Speaker, is irresponsible. It speaks to a lack of understanding of how the economy in Ontario works, Mr. Speaker. It speaks to a lack of understanding of the needs for the 21st century, and it speaks to a lack of understanding of Ontario's position in the world. Well, we understand that, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please.
Final supplementary. The Premier doesn't understand is that this asset is owned by the people of Ontario and should be owned by them and their children and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren from here on in. You know, it used to be the only way to pay for transit in this province was by tolling the roads. And when the Liberals found that that was not the Minister of Transportation, the public, come to order. All of a sudden, they're going to have an asset sale and sell off everything that Ontarians own. And you know what? It's not just you Democrats who see the privatization plan of the Premier for the nonsense that it actually is. Member it's from not Trinity just the Spadina, of people who are taking to social media and sending letters telling the Liberals that their plan is wrong. The Toronto Star editorial says, Privatizing electricity grid was a bad idea when Mike Harris's Conservatives came up with it in 2001, and it still is. Globe and Mail says the mandate Ontario's Liberal government handed Question. former TD Bank chief Ed Clark was flawed from the outset, setting off priced electricity, selling off priced electricity assets to pay for transit projects, Thank smacked you. of more cash, a more of a cash grab than a considered approach. It's Thank you. Thank you. Here, well, um, we are going to be extremely, extremely thoughtful and careful, Mr. Speaker, in all of the work that we do around leveraging assets, Mr. Speaker. The member from Timmins, James Bay, will come to order. Thank you. Finish, please. It is extremely important to the future economy, to the present economy of this province, Mr. Speaker, that we demonstrate the will to make the investments that are necessary. We cannot, we cannot talk to other countries. We cannot talk to people in other countries. We can't talk to people in China or South America about investing in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, unless we have demonstrated the will to make the investments that are necessary. Now, the fact is that we have to, we have to leverage our assets, Mr. Speaker, and we have to work with the private sector, because that's really at the root of what the leader of the third party is talking about. Answer. She doesn't want to work with the private sector, Mr. Speaker, except that when her party was in office, they signed nine private power generating contracts, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. So apparently do one thing. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier. A cut is a cut, no matter what the Premier calls it. Yesterday, the Premier called half a billion dollar education cut an adjustment. People are being fired, but the Premier says boards have staffed differently. Now, firing is firing, no matter what the Premier calls it, Speaker. Will the Premier admit that she's cutting education and telling Ontarians how many more schools are going to be closed and how many more education workers are going to be fired in her 2015 budget? Well, Mr. Speaker, let's just begin with the fact that we've built 725 schools in this province, Mr. Speaker, since uh, this government's been in office, and there are oh, more than 700 renovations. So, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, on balance, there has been much more building and renovation and enhancement of, uh, of school buildings, if that's what we're talking about, Mr. Mr. Speaker, than there has been otherwise. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the third party understood how staffing models work, Mr. Speaker, across boards and in classrooms, well, seriously, if the if the leader of the third party understood that boards make decisions, and in fact, Mr. Speaker, schools make decisions about how they're going to allocate staff, and as as enrollment declines, Mr. Speaker, there are decisions that boards have to make across the province. But even in the face of declining enrollment, Mr. Speaker, education Answer. funding in this province is stable in the face of fewer students in our schools, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Speaker, I think what we need to do is renovate this chamber so that it's big enough for the Premier's eagle. <laughs> The Premier said if a board chooses to change their staffing because their funding is changing, that's their prerogative. I think Ontarians might appreciate, Speaker, a translation from liberal ease into plain old English. What the Premier was really saying was that the Liberals are cutting school board funding and education workers, therefore, therefore are being fired. 
um, on all sites, please. Please finish. The Liberals are cutting school board funding, and education workers are getting fired. Gee, that's so hard to understand. Yeah. And the Premier is trying to duck responsibility by blaming the boards. Where's the Premier said she got into politics because of cuts to education. Most people thought she was talking about fighting those cuts, not implementing them. Will she stop the cuts Thank to you. education? Yeah. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Previous answer, Mr. Speaker, when I was talking about staffing. The fact is that mm, 30 years ago, I was cutting my teeth on staffing committees. I was on staffing committees, Mr. Speaker, as a parent. I was working with the school board, Mr. Speaker, to try to understand how staffing worked. I'll get my work out, but I'm not going to ask for quiet, please. Thank you. And it was that point, at that point, Mr. Speaker, that I learned how education was working. And the member for uh, Kitchener, what, uh, Waterloo, um, was talking about those years, and those were difficult years because we were working up to uh, having to fight the cuts that Mike Harris was making, Mr. Speaker, and they were the amalgamations. It was, they were, those were very, very difficult years. Well, Mr. Speaker, those years are gone. There are billions and billions more dollars in education, Mr. Speaker. That funding Answer. is stable despite the fact that there are fewer students in our schools. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, it's not just schools that the Premier is cutting. The Liberals are also cutting health care. Just this week, we learned that there are new nursing cuts in London and Kitchener. Earlier today, we were joined by the Ontario Health Coalition, together with international health experts who are standing up for health care in Niagara. Will the Premier do the right thing, if not in education, then perhaps in health care, and ensure that the people of the Niagara region have access to health care when and where they need it, and keep the Niagara region ho hospitals open instead of closing them? Yeah. I, I just want to speak to the, the, the theme of these questions. The theme is that we can't change anything, that nothing should change. There should be no transit built, Mr. Speaker. There should be no roads and bridges built, Mr. Speaker, because we can't raise the money to do that. There should be no, no change at the local school board level, no consolidation of schools, no community hubs created, Mr. Speaker, no renovation of new schools so that new programs can be uh, uh, given to kids, Mr. Speaker. There should be no transformation of the health care system. There should be no more home care. In in our communities because that would require change and that would require a different kind of staffing. So the theme of the NDP, Mr. Speaker, is everything's fine. We can't change a thing because we cannot look ahead. We cannot use our imagination. We cannot work with the private sector or school boards or hospitals to make the changes that are necessary. That's not who we are, Mr. Speaker. That's who they are. Thank you. New question? The member from Nipissing. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Just when you hoped the smell from your gas plant scandal was dissipating, today the odour is as strong as ever. The company you gave a sweetheart deal to as part of your Liberal Seat Saver program is at it again. Eastern Power and its subsidiary Greenfield South have now apparently built a pipeline without a permit to service your wrongly relocated Mississauga gas plant. You know, this is the same company you gave a $36 million payout for sunk costs and a $45 million no-interest loan. <clears throat> According to the Auditor General, the total cost of the cancellation is $275 million. Premier, you can't cut a tree down in Ontario without a permit. How did you allow your buddies to build a pipeline without one? I've uh, met, made, made this point before. When I stand up and I get quiet, it stays that way, and you don't use it for a chance to get another one in. Premier. Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, it sounds like the sky is falling down over this, this dispute and this contract, Mr. Speaker. 
The reality is, Mr. Speaker, what is going on here is a, is a dispute over uh, where a link will be, where a pipe will go to uh, provide the gas to this particular facility. Mr. Speaker, it's an issue that is under the jurisdiction of the Ontario Energy Board. The, the dispute has brought before the Ontario Never from Energy Leeds Board. Grenville. I understand the Ontario Energy Board is going to decide uh, sometime today or tomorrow to say the pipe is going here or it's going there, Mr. Speaker. That's the issue. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from the Fian Carlton. She contracted for a power plant where it wasn't wanted and where it should never have been put in the first place. Then she cancelled it to save Liberal seats in the 2011 election as the campaign co-chair. Later, when her friends at Eastern Power and Greenfield wouldn't stop construction for another two months after the election, she bent over backwards, opening the public purse to pay for a purely political promise. Now, we find that this Liberal government has turned a blind eye to what Eastern Power is doing at the newly relocated site in Lambton. They are doing whatever they want. Given the gas plant scandal and more recently the Sudbury by-election scandal, Speaker, should Ontarians really be surprised that this Premier is willing to ignore the law if it suits her Question. own public participation interest? Mr. Speaker, let's start with the fact that that particular plant is being built with a willing host community, Mr. Speaker. That's number one. Number two, Mr. Speaker, this dispute has to do with where a member from the PM Carlton come to order and to bring the gas to the site. To order. Mr. Speaker, that is a dispute that is being resolved between the parties and has been brought before the Ontario Energy Board. They'll be issuing a decision as to where that particular pipe will go, Mr. Speaker, and the issue will be resolved. They're making a mountain out of a molehill. They're trying to go back to the days when they could stand up every year, every day, and talk about the gas plant scandal, Mr. Speaker. The reality is. We built 20 new gas plants in this province, Mr. For Speaker. Bruce Gray They're working, time. functioning. There's two no new ones going under construction, and this one, Mr. Speaker, has a dispute about a connection for a gas line. Mr. Speaker, they should get. The member from the PM Carlton will come to order, and I do remind her to use the uh, titles or writings, and I will be forceful on that. New question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. What, my question is to the Premier. Premier, we know that you're about to have an interview with the Ontario Provincial Police in regards to the bribery scandal. We know that it's reported that the Ontario Provincial Police do want to interview Mr. Sub uh, Mrs. Sabera, Mr. Lougheed, and the MPP from Sudbury, Mr. Thibault. Can you confirm if those meetings are to take place and the interviews will go forward? Junior. Mr. Speaker, I've, uh, I've been clear that uh, I will be having an interview before the end of the month. Uh, the investigation is taking place outside of this House. It's not taking place in this legislature, Mr. Speaker, and I'll uh, work with the authorities uh, outside of the legislature. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, a very simple question. There are three people that are also under investigation, Madam Sabera, Mr. Lougheed, and Mr. Thibault. The question is, is the Ontario Provincial Police setting up meetings and have your members agreed to have those meetings with the OPP to be interviewed in regards to the Sudbury bribe bribery scandal, yes or no? Mr. Speaker, I can only speak for my schedule. Some days I can barely speak for my schedule, um, but I can only speak for my schedule. I know that I am going to be meeting with the, uh, the OPP before the end of the month, Mr. Speaker. I will work with the authorities out, uh, outside of this legislature, but that is the point. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the investigation is taking place outside of the legislature with the authorities, and I will work with them in that process. Thank you. New question, member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, we know that farmers feed cities and are an integral part of our $34 billion agri-food industry. But if it's going to grow and continue to compete internationally, more needs to be done. In October of 2013, the Premier challenged our agri-food industry to double its growth rate to create 120,000 new jobs by 2020. In order to help meet this challenge, we need to work with that industry to identify opportunities for growth and innovation. Now, just last weekend, Mr. Speaker, in Waterloo Region, for instance, Elmira's Maple Syrup Festival attracted a crowd of thousands. They ate 10,000 pancakes smothered with over 
680 litres of maple syrup made by local Question. producers. And one of them is a good friend of mine, Dennis Weber, who's a third generation maple syrup producer near St. Jacob's. So I'd like to ask the minister to update this house on the status of the Premier's growth plan. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture. Food thank you, uh, thank rural you very affairs. much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the uh, great member from Kitchener Centre to ask this question, who had a Mr. Speaker had a very distinguished career with CTV News before she arrived here. So she she has a great perspective of what's going on right out in the province of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the maple syrup is one of our province's oldest traditional agricultural products. Yeah. We have more than 2,500 producers right across the province of Ontario, and we all know that Leonard County in eastern Ontario is the maple syrup capital of Ontario. Uh, together, we harvest about 1.5 million litres of surplus, making Ontario one of the top three producers in Canada, grossing more than $32 million in maple product sales and contributing over $53 million to Canada's GDP. Wow. Mr. Speaker, our government, your government, is here to work with the agri-food industry, our partners, Sir. and maple syrup producers to help them meet the Premier's growth challenge. We will measure progress as we move along our way with our new growth steering committee that we recently announced. Success. A big I stand, you sit. <laughs> Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that answer, and uh, we'll hear some more from you in just a moment. It's encouraging to hear that our government is committed to working with our maple syrup producers. But, Minister, in December of 2014, the federal government announced changes to the federal maple products regulations under the Canada Agricultural Products Act. This is for common standards for grading, color classifications, and labeling for maple products across all maple producing jurisdictions. The approved regulation came into effect in December of last year with a two-year implementation period to allow time for the industry to meet the new requirements. Now, spokespeople with the Ontario Maple Syrup Products Association are telling us that regulatory harmonization would provide a number of benefits to their industry. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform this House on a timeline when Ontario producers can expect to see changes? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Kitchener Centre for the supplementary. We are uh, very aware of the new standards that have been brought in by the Government of Canada. Uh, we'll be starting a consultation with small, medium, and large maple syrup producers uh, throughout Ontario. Uh, consultations will help to identify and address our requests made by maple syrup producers, including the grading and classification of maple products. We want to ensure, as the Premier says, that we have a very robust conversation and encouraging growth and exploring how the sector can contribute to the Premier's agri-growth food challenge. Our government, your government, is committed to working with our maple syrup producers to meet their needs and support them in their efforts to grow their businesses and contribute positively to Ontario's economy. And I do know that those pancakes yes, in Elmira came from Peterborough, from Quaker Oats, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Question the member from Bruce Gray, Owen South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Community and Social Services. Yesterday, you released the SAMS, Such a Mess System interim report. Sadly, it was 20 pages of nothing. In fact, the scope of the report explicitly says it does not provide an assessment of the overall system infrastructure performance of SAMS. Minister, vulnerable citizens who depend on social assistance want answers. Frontline workers want answers. Yet this report is obviously just an attempt by your government to deflect people from the real problem and a waste of $200,000. Minister, can you explain why these key areas were omitted from the report and how the people of Ontario can trust you to manage this file going forward. That's a good question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, certainly, we have acknowledged the problems with SAMS, and we know that there is a lot more work to do. And this is why we commissioned uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers to help us going forward in terms of improving the system. Uh, in terms of the functionality of the system, of course, the proof really is how are we helping vulnerable Ontarians. We have now had five successful pay runs for both ODSP and OW, Mr. Speaker. Payment to 570,000 families, over 3 million from pay Prince Edward Hastings. vulnerable uh, Ontarians. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary.
Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Ministry of Community and Social Services. Minister, yesterday in scrums, when asked why you implemented a system that clearly wasn't ready, you responded by saying, and I quote, hindsight is 2020. When you say it will be a seamless rollout, despite warnings from frontline workers and the opposition, you had better be certain. And I'm going to challenge your five seamless runs. Yesterday was check day, and hundreds of thousands of people did not get their checks That's yesterday. That's true. That's Minister. true. You are playing That's with true. people's lives. Our vulnerable recipients deserve better, and so do our frontline staff. Minister, people have lost confidence. Will you do the honourable thing, accept responsibility for the continuing Sam's boondoggle, and resign today? Oh, here we go. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there is some incorrect information related to yesterday's check run. I've been assured that it was a success. I have visited, Mr. Speaker. I have from visited Bruce Gray, a Sound. number of front line offices. I have visited Hamilton ODSP, Brantford OW, Toronto OW, North Bay DSAB, and the ODSP office there, Peterborough OW and ODSP, Ottawa OW, and I was able to thank some of the social assistance workers in Mississauga here, 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 here. for their great efforts in ensuring. I have listened to frontline workers. I want to thank them for their dedication. I want to thank them for their frankness in speaking directly to me with their concerns. This is precisely what PricewaterhouseCoopers is addressing. And in the final report, we look forward to their recommendations. Thank you. Question: The member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. No one is, no one is above accountability in this legislature. But the Minister of Community and Social Services. That'll do. Carry on. But the Minister of Community and Social Services refuses to take responsibility over the SAMS fiasco. Since November, families have been underpaid. Checks have been too late to pay the rent. Staff are overwhelmed and exhausted, and just yesterday, SAMS had to be rebooted, forcing staff to reassess many of their cases. SAMS is a nightmare, but the Liberals stink, still think they aren't accountable to the people of Ontario. Speaker, what will it take for the Premier to ask for the Minister's resignation? Mr. Speaker, well, I know the Minister of Community and Social Services will want to uh, speak to the supplementary, but I believe I just heard her take responsibility, Mr. Speaker. I believe I just heard her say that she and we recognize that there have been problems with the implementation of SAMS, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely, we understand that there have been problems. And furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we understand that there has been stress on frontline workers. That's why the minister has been visiting offices. That's why she has been listening to what they have to say. That's why there is a report being written, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is there needed to be a change. There needed to be a new system put in place. There have been problems with the implementation of that system, and the fact is we are addressing those problems, Mr. Speaker, so that the frontline workers will have the support that they Answer. need and so that the service to recipients will be improved. The member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order, second time. Supplementary. The minister told us last Thursday, quote, we have been extremely successful. But here's how the Liberals measure success. 21 weeks of chaos, 500,000 T5s shredded, 720 clients' privacy breached, 240 million and counting wasted on software that doesn't work. Doesn't work. And now $200,000 spent on a report that ignores the biggest issues that staff and recipients have been telling the Liberals for months the functionality of the system doesn't work. How much needs to go wrong before the Premier asks this minister to resign? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my responsibility certainly lies looking forward to ensuring that SAMS does come to full implementation. I'm taking that extremely seriously. This is why we wanted a fresh set of eyes with PricewaterhouseCoopers to give us some good advice going forward. And in fact, they have acknowledged some of the successes to date. Uh, some fi 57 priority issues have been addressed. 
Uh, we have opened helplines to assist those staff who are clearly quite stressed. Uh, we have developed new and updated job aids, and uh, we are releasing updates regularly to staff to improve communication. So I am uh, given the mandate by our Premier to continue to work as hard as I can to ensure that all our officials Answer. are also doing that, uh, to ensure that vulnerable Ontarians are yeah, looked yeah, after yeah, yeah. appropriately. Thank you. The question the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yesterday at the Legislature, I was able to see the medals for the Pan Para Pan Am Games up close and personal. And let me tell you, and let me tell you, oh, which minister? I said, oh, this question, is the question. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, the question is for the Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture, and Sport. Thank you. <laughs> And as I, was, as I was saying, those medals are simply amazing. I was able to see how they were made and learn of the story behind them. The artwork of the medals was designed in collaboration with Christy Belcour, a Metis visual artist. And this is the first time that Braille has been incorporated into medals for the Pan Para Pan Am Games. Seeing the medals here in the legislature allowed everything to really sink in. The Pan Para Pan Am Games are coming. And yesterday marked 100 days until the Games, and I am so excited to be welcoming so many people to our province. Speaker, can the minister responsible for the Pan Para Pan Am Games update us on where we are at 99 days out Question. from the Games? Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, responsible for the Pan Am Para Pan Games. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Davenport for her advocacy and her uh, working within her community to uh, really push these games. Thank you so much. I know you're a big supporter, and you're doing a great job in engaging your community. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're 99 days away from the games, and the excitement is building. Over 60,000 people have signed up to volunteer. We've sold over 350,000 tickets in 15 of the capital venues, including 11 of the athletic facilities have been completed, and they're open up for community use. Wow. Yesterday, we marked the 100th day until the Games by welcoming 100 new Canadians wow. with a citizenship ceremony held at our spectacular yeah. Athletes Village. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this was a great example of how these Games embody so much more than just the Pan Am yeah, Games. They represent the diversity that we value here in the province of Ontario, and I'm so proud to Thank support you. these Games. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. And excitement for the Games is building up in my riding of Davenport and across the province, and the celebrations have already begun. Last week, I attended the Ignite event held in the Legislature. Through the Ignite program, Ontario is supporting celebrations across the province to connect residents and visitors with the spirit and cultural diversity of the Pan Para Pan Am Games. At the event last week, there was food from Latin America and the Caribbean, steel band performers, people painting murals, among other performers. The, the event gave only a sneak peek of what we can expect as the Games begin and into the excitement that will take over our province over the next 99 days. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you tell us more about how government is supporting communities in celebrations of the Pan Para Pan Am Games? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank you to the member. Uh, when we won the bid for these Games, we felt it was important to have these Games in 60 municipalities across the Golden Horseshoe. Agreed. And the torch will stop in 130 communities, yeah. starting in beautiful Thunder Bay. Wow! Thunder Bay. Fantastic. We want people from across this province to share in this excitement and, of course, to support a wide range of events and organizations helping to promote and celebrate the spirit of these games. And that's why I'm proud that our government has funded 103 Ignite celebrations in communities across the great province of Ontario wow. to engage communities. Wow. 2015 is a time for celebrating our Pan-American connection and the spirit of sport. And in 99 days, we'll host the largest multi-sport event in the history of this nation. And I am so proud to be part of these games, Mr. Yes, sir. Yeah, speaker, to the Premier. Premier, just before you became Liberal leader in 2012, you stated, and I quote, when I say we need to stay on our government's fiscal plan of balancing the budget by 2017-18, I mean it, end quote. So, you want us to believe in two years a balanced budget in spite of the fact your deficits have been increasing over the past three years, not decreasing. Yep. And your hand-picked economist, Don Drummond, predicts again in two years a 30.2 
$1.5 billion deficit. You say zero. Who are we to believe? You or your repeatedly misleading numbers for Don Drummond? Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. An interesting question. Given the fact that we released a report back in November talking about some of the challenges before us over the next 20 years, we commissioned the report from Mr. Drummond himself, who provided a number of recommendations, of which we are now applying well over 80 percent. He himself has acknowledged that we far exceeded even his expectations. But I guess, I guess to answer your question more directly, you should believe the numbers that are being reported. And the numbers that are being reported is that $1.6 billion has been saved by this government over this year. We're we're on track to balance by 2017-18, and I'm very proud of the work that all Ontarians are doing to step it up. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Speaker. Supplementary. I certainly don't believe either one of you, and year after year, you present to this House phony deficit numbers, fake numbers, purposely designed to confuse the people of Ontario into thinking. Stop the clock, please. The member from Beaches East Stork will withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. John? People of Ontario into thinking that your increasing deficits aren't that significant. Your inflated deficit projections are a deliberate scam to obfuscate the real deficit numbers that continue to go up. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. It's a bit of a trick to obfuscate. Premier, you've done this three years. The member will withdraw, and now I will ask the Premier to answer. That's right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, what's wrong with you? know, Mr. Speaker, and really to all members of this House, we try to do our best with integrity, and we are being very forthright in what we do. Um, no, no, seriously, the, the, we, we respect. To me, please. I respect questions that come before us, and I believe people's intentions, regardless of political stripe, I think their intentions are good. But frankly, to suggest that we are trying to do something otherwise, but to try to bring forward something that is real to the people of Ontario is what we've done. The Conference Board of Canada have already cited that Ontario far exceeds every other government in Canada for its integrity. And we do believe that Ontarians want Answer. what we're about to put forward, and that's improved numbers on track to balance by 2017-18, and we'll work together. Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor West. Here. Speaker, I have asked the Premier three times this week if she will prohibit university boards of governors from negotiating million-dollar salaries for university presidents. Yesterday, the President of the Treasury Board said that Bill 8 would address this issue. The problem is, Speaker, Bill 8 does nothing to prevent double salary payouts from being negotiated in the future. Ontarians could be seeing more double salary deals for university presidents, paid for by public dollars, rising student tuition fees and cuts to university budgets. Premier, university presidents are already among the highest paid public sector employees in Ontario. How can your government defend a system that allows university presidents to earn twice their salary if they don't go on leave? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, in fact, uh, none of us on this side of the House is defending that. And in fact, I'm very pleased to know that a portion of the president's salary will be, re will be returned, Mr. Speaker. We know that there's a problem with executive compensation. That's why we brought in Bill 8, Mr. Speaker. That's why we brought in the Accountability Act. And just to correct, just to correct what the uh, member said, in fact, the Accountability Act does enable the government to prohibit pay in lieu of leave when looking at compensation frameworks. I asked that question explicitly, Mr. Speaker. It does allow us to look, as we look at the whole compensation, the executive compensation, it is possible within that, uh, within the scope of Bill 8, to look at exactly this kind of thing. So, Mr. Speaker, we're not defending it. We're not defending it. We are looking at the, the whole compensation package, Mr. Speaker, including this kind of mechanism. Thank you. Thank you.
2012, the Liberal government told Ontarians that executive pay would be permanently capped at no more than double the Premier's salary of $418,000 per year. Speaker, we now know that last year, 181 individuals made more than twice the Premier's salary, an increase of 24 per cent from the year before. So the Mr. problem of skyrocketing, to order. skyrocketing public sector CEO salaries in Ontario is clearly getting worse. It's not getting better. But yesterday, the Deputy Premier assured this House that Bill 8 sets limits on public sector CEO compensation. Of course, anyone who reads the bill knows that it does not cap compensation. However, on Monday, the Liberal member of Kitchener Centre told CBCKW something completely different. When asked about the out-of-control public sector CEO salary, she said, we're going to see a hard cap, so look for it in the upcoming budget. Which is it, Premier? In the face of cuts to hospitals and schools and soaring public CEO pay, it's an insult to hardworking families. Speaker, can the Premier tell Ontarians whether her government will follow through on its promise to cap public sector Thank CEO you. salaries or just keep telling Ontarians one thing and doing the next? Speaker, we've been very clear that there will be caps, Mr. Speaker. That's what uh, Bill 8 was about. The Accountability Act is there, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. What's remarkable is that this party, the NDP, didn't vote for that oh, act, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows full well that there will be caps, knows that there will be a range, and she also knows, Mr. Speaker, that her leader, her leader also said that there need to be exemptions. She said, and this is November 27, 2013, the NDP leader said, when we're talking about people at the top nuclear engineers in the world, for example, we've made an exemption for that type of case in the bill. We would have to look at those folks on a case-by-case -case basis. That's why the exemption exists. The NDP understands that we need caps. We've got caps in the bill, Mr. Speaker. The NDP understands that there has to be a range of salaries. That's in the bill. The NDP understands there have to be exemptions. That's in the bill. And they didn't vote for it, Mr. Speaker. Order. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, come to order. Start the clock, please. New question, member from Ottawa Orleans. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And youth services. Minister, I think it is safe to say that all of us in this House can agree that giving our children and youth the best start possible in life is a top priority, and I know this is a top priority for you and for your ministry. This is especially true for children and youth with autism spectrum disorder as well as the families and loved ones who take care of them. Minister, as today is World Autism Awareness Day, pourriez-vous, s'il vous plaît, nous informer sur le... Can you inform the House what the work is done by your ministry concerning autism? Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for this very important question on this very important day. Children living with autism, as well as the family members who help and support them, are indeed some of the most inspiring people I have met since becoming the Minister of Children and Youth Services. I am very, very um, happy about the progress of our government concerning those children. Based services and supports, which are helping 8,000 children each year become more independent and improve their communication and social skills. Through our Autism Intervention Program speaker, we've increased intensive behavior intervention services to children and youth with autism across the province. And more importantly, speaker, and most importantly, we've more than quadrupled the investments in autism services for children and youth. I thank the member for giving the opportunity to speak to this. Merci, Madame Le thank you. Strong action being taken by this government to help improve the lives of children and youth with autism. Je suis très heureuse d'apprendre que des investissements substantiels sont faits dans ce domaine. I am very happy to learn that there have been numerous investments in this field. About autism services frequently. 
This issue is very close to my heart and close to home. Having a place to go to get answers to these questions will be a valuable resource for any parents trying to find opportunity for their son or daughter and the services in the area. For this reason, Mr. Speaker, I ask you through you to the Minister of Children and Youth Services, can you please tell this House about the places parents can go to find current information on autism and the services that they may be available? Thank you. Minister. Again, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Notre gouvernement continue Our government continues to fund services for children with autism and their families. We are funding numerous programs in this field, and it's wonderful to see that these programs will give a chance to in these families and children to participate in very important activities like swimming, music, and music, for example. It includes tracking links to available services and the latest research, information on support, treatments, transitions, coping strategies, and so much more. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, a very special guest with us in the House today, six-year-old Aidan Lee, an inspiring young man and the artist behind the Art Autism Resource Kit. Thank you, Aidan, for your you. beautiful artwork. Thank you. New question. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, in 2010, Mr. Jim McEwen, a Durham Region resident, suffered a stroke at the age of 55. Like many post-stroke patients, Mr. McEwen has required hundreds of physiotherapy treatments to regain mobility and improve his quality of life. However, when Mr. McEwen needed our health care system the most, he was afforded only a dozen treatments and then was forgotten about. In fact, the OHIP model for physiotherapy greatly limits the coverage to those between the ages of 20 and 64. As a result, post-stroke patients in this age range struggle for access to the re rehabilitation services they need and deserve. Minister, my question is simple. Will you take steps to ensure all post-stroke patients, regardless of age, have access to sufficient rehabilitation services? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I appreciate the very thoughtful question from the member opposite. I've received her letter on this issue. I know there's a private member's bill this afternoon that's going to be debated on the same issue as well. It's an issue that I know is important to many, many Ontarians. Uh, the, the member opposite, I, I believe, does know that the ministry for several years now has been, uh, as part of our transformation away from uh, program and service focused funding to funding which is focused on quality, evidence and outcomes. We've oh, begun really? that important work on stroke services. Uh, we've made some important changes, and now we're moving on our attention. We have been for some time through the ministry on precisely the issue that the member opposite has raised, and that's to uh, ensure that our approach to rehabilitation of stroke, post-stroke uh, patients and that are focused on the same quality and uh, positive outcomes, evidence that we would hope uh, will lead to the best possible outcome for patients. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, Minister, as you will know, this is not a question about the changes that were made in physiotherapy several years ago, with which we strongly disagree. It is a question more of age discrimination. And the fact of the matter is that people who suffer from strokes do not get the services they need if they're between the ages of 20 and 64. There is a large body of evidence indicating that with consistent rehabilitation, post-stroke patients can show dramatic improvements to their health well past the six-month mark. However, the Ontario Stroke Network says that the rehabilitation needs of only about 50 per cent of post-stroke patients are now being met. We need to recognize that there's a great need for comprehensive and integrated post-stroke management that reflects the long-term nature of stroke recovery. So, Minister, as you've indicated, you're aware that this afternoon I'm bringing forward a private member's motion asking your government to find the necessary in-house savings for all post-stroke patients. Will you commit to su supporting my motion this afternoon? Thank you. Mr. Hoffman, thank you. Well, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I certainly don't want to imply that uh, this isn't an important issue, but I do want 
uh, to reiterate the fact that this is an issue that my ministry is and has been for some time working on the elements that are expressed uh, in her letter and in her private member's bill. She knows that, I believe she does, that, uh, that our government not only being committed to uh, providing the best possible care for stroke patients, but is moving on that important issue of ensuring that it's also provided on the rehabilitative yeah. side of things. Uh, in fact, just uh, last week, uh, I made an important announcement, both on the, both on the physio side as well as on the as, as what's known as Assess and Restore at uh, Toronto Rehab, which focuses on specifically the issue that she's raising, is how to make sure that we get these individuals Answer. back to full independence. But we have made important changes with regards to stroke services. My ministry for some time has been Thank working you. on the precise issue that she's raised. Here. The member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, as you may know, the town of Fort Erie passed a resolution to once again give $500,000 of the town's money to the racetrack in order to keep the track open and operation. Premier, this money is being given by the town to cover the loss of the gaming funds that resulted when your government ripped out the slot machines in Fort Erie and have never put them back. And this is important, Premier, I'd like you to listen to this line. The track itself has a plan to become self-sustainable and not require any money from the province or from the taxpayers of Fort Erie. The town fully supports keeping the track open. With, will this government return the slots Question. to Fort Erie Racetrack so the track can thrive and the burden is not on the taxpayers of Fort Erie? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I do appreciate the question from my good friend, uh, the member for Niagara Falls. In fact, it just seems a short time ago I extended the invitation to my good friend, the member for Niagara Falls, when I had the opportunity uh, to be in Fort Erie uh, with the leaders of the thoroughbred horse racing industry in Fort Erie to announce that, indeed, that this government has uh, allocated more racing days for the great track at Fort Erie, which is something that's very important. Mr. Speaker, we've listened carefully. We had a panel made up of three of the most distinguished individuals that serve in this legislature. My good friend, the Honourable Albert Buchanan, who sat with that party, very distinguished member. The Honourable John Snowball that sat on those benches over there. And of course, our friend, uh, the Honourable John Wilkinson. That panel put forward a framework for horse racing province of Ontario. We're galloping forward when it comes to horse racing. Member from uh, Huron, Bruce. Speaker. Thank you very much. I just want to share with the House that the page from here in Bruce Raul Pandia won the right to compete in the Provincial Legion's public speaking contest on April 25th, and I wish him the best of luck. Minister Children and Youth Services on Point of Order. Speaker, I also have people from the South the, uh, Asian Autistic Centre in Scarborough, Geetha Mortis, and three others here joining us today to, spell, to, to uh, celebrate Autism Awareness Day. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the, second, on the motion for a second reading of Bill 45. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell.
Yeah, it's busy. All members, please take their seats. Ted, did you get that uh, memo? All members, take your seats, please. On December 3rd, 2014, Ms. Dharma moved the second reading of Bill 45, an act to enhance public health by enacting in Healthy Menu Choices Act 2014 and Electronic Cigarettes Act 2014, and by amending the Smoke-Free Ontario Act. Mr. Leal has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Leal's motion, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leo. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasen. Mr. Balkasen. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassen. Ms. Jassen. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. <coughs> All those polls, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Mr. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Madame Jelina. Madame Jelina. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes being 52 and the nays being 41, I declare the motion carried. Ms. Darmala has moved second reading of Bill 45, an act to enhance public health by enacting the Health Menu Cho Healthy Menu Choices Act 2014 and the Electronic Cigarettes Act 2014, and by amending the Smoke-Free Ontario Act. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carry? No. I heard no. All those, uh, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Thank you. The ayes have it carried. We have the bill. Deuxième lecture in Cote Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. So ordered. So ordered. There, uh, there are no further votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.